guys so much for joining us this morning, and thank you for all that you do. Man, you, these young people are coming up right, and it's because of your leadership, and we thank you. <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles this morning yet again to Luke chapter 10. And we are reading verses 38 through 42. So Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And I read it in your hearing, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Our sermon title for this morning is the good portion. Let's pray. Just a second, sorry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for blessing us this morning on this wonderful Sabbath day. We've had the chance to come and sing your praises and hear a praises sung to you, dear Heavenly Father. We're asking that you would not only accept our worship, but that you would descend upon us now and speak to us through your holy word. Lord, I am your servant. Send me to the side and allow your words and your voice to be heard by us this morning. Bless us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our story begins with Jesus entering what the Bible calls a certain town. Now, Luke doesn't give a name to this town, but we know from other studies and other readings and other Gospels that this town is the town of Bethany. And we know that because Jesus' good friends, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, live in this town. Now, this is the first story in the Bible where we meet Martha and Mary. So, as Luke tells the story, he tells it as if Jesus is meeting them for the first time. So, as Luke says, Jesus is passing through Bethany, and he is invited to stay at this house by this woman named Martha. Now, I'm sure that Martha was excited to invite Jesus into her home. Jesus, at this point, has been going around the entire area of Galilee. He's been healing the sick, healing the lame, and his fame has been spreading throughout the entire area. So I'd imagine that when Jesus started passing through Bethany, that some chatter started going around. And as that chatter was going around, Martha, maybe she was standing outside of her home, started speaking to someone as they were passing by, and she asked, oh, what's going on? And someone said, didn't you hear? Jesus of Nazareth is here in Bethany. So Martha, now with joy in her heart because this Jesus of Nazareth, this great teacher and healer is passing through the town, she hopes that Jesus might pass her way. She gets her opportunity. And Jesus begins to pass by her home. So in excitement, Martha runs up to Jesus and asks, Lord, will you be a guest in my home today? Jesus says, yes. Martha is full of joy. And I'm sure that Martha rushed home before Jesus even got there, got into the house, gathered her servants up, and started preparing to serve Jesus. Jesus comes into the house, begins to get settled, and as Jesus is settling, Martha is busy making sure things are prepared. 
You see, she's not just trying to make sure that Jesus is comfortable, but she wants to make sure that Jesus is well-fed. She needs to make sure that she makes a great impression on Jesus so that they can be friends. So Martha goes and begins to prepare the meal. Now, it's important for us to understand that we're talking about a time that was over 2,000 years ago. There was no electricity which means there were no ovens. There were no microwaves. As a matter of fact, there were no refrigerators. So in order for Martha to prepare this meal, she had to make everything from scratch. You couldn't just go into the fridge, pull out a steak and throw it on the stove. You had to go kill the cow and cut out the meat and clean the meat and then put it on your stove. But the stove was not electric. It wasn't gas. It was a piece of metal sitting on some blocks of stone. So Mary had to go chop the wood and bring the wood inside and put the wood underneath the stove and start a fire to hope that it would light up and hope that it would warm up in time before Jesus would get tired. But not only that, let's say Martha wanted to make a salad. In order to make the salad, she couldn't go into the refrigerator, open that little bag with the lettuce and the nicely cut carrots. No, if she wanted lettuce, she had to grow the lettuce, pick up the lettuce, break apart the lettuce, and put it in a bowl. If she wanted carrots, she had to go outside, dig up the carrots, cut up the carrots herself, and put them in the salad. If Mary wanted water... She had to go and grab some heavy clay jugs, lug them down to the well, get the water and fill the jugs, and then carry the already heavy jugs back to her place with the water, and then hope that the stove was hot enough to boil it. This was a long and strenuous process. And in the midst of Martha doing all of this work, she passes by a room and sees Jesus sitting and talking to Mary. Now, Mary is the little sister. Mary is supposed to be helping Martha prepare all of this stuff. But not only is Martha mad because Mary is not helping her, Martha is upset because Mary, a woman, is sitting and joining in conversation with a teacher, with a rabbi, with Jesus, which was not right when it came to Palestinian custom. So Mary is sitting, doing something, that she has no business doing, and Martha is upset. So Martha, in her anger, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, tell my sister to get up and help me with all of this work. But Jesus, instead of taking the side of Martha, takes the side of Mary. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're so troubled with all of the other things that you're doing. Now, when Jesus said Martha's name twice, he wasn't saying her name twice out of emphasis. He was saying her name twice out of extreme concern. The only other time you see someone's name used twice like this in the New Testament is when God is calling Saul, who we later know as Paul, for the first time. And Jesus calls out to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The same level of concern is what Jesus is passing off to Martha. Now, why in the world would Jesus say something like this to Martha for her doing her job? All Martha is doing is being a good host. She's being a good woman in the home, making sure that things are prepared, making sure that the guests are comfortable. Jesus should know this. So why is Jesus so concerned with Martha's attitude? 
When you go back up in, the, in this chapter and you go back up to verse 40, you find out why Jesus is so concerned. Verse 40 in this text says that Martha was distracted with much serving. Martha is distracted. Now, you would think to yourself, that doesn't sound like distraction because it sounds like Martha is doing her job. And when you're distracted from something, that means that there is something that is holding you back from your ultimate goal. So that means Martha's goal is the problem. You see, Martha is so concerned with impressing Jesus that she has forfeited the chance to get into a relationship with Jesus. In other words, Martha is distracted with impressing Jesus. Now, when you look at it like that, you understand why Jesus is so concerned. Because the goal of Martha should not be to simply impress Christ. The goal of Martha should be to get to know him, to get into a relationship with him so that she can learn from him. But you see, Martha's problem is not only with Martha. I would suggest that we as Christians have the exact same problem today because there are too many of us that are so focused on impressing Jesus that we fail to enter into a relationship with Jesus. You see, there's this thing that we as Christians do. It's something that we have taught. I don't know where it comes from, but we have come up with this idea that because we're Christians... Because we have accepted Jesus into our lives and we have allowed Jesus to enter into our hearts because we found Jesus, we must now show Jesus how clean up we are. We've got to show Jesus how much progress that we've made. We've got to show Jesus how much we have cleaned up our lives. And we spend so much time trying to impress Jesus that we miss the point of meeting him in the first place. It happens all the time. You see it in church. People come, oh yeah, I'm here on Sabbath. Look, Jesus, look what I'm doing. I've turned away from my old life. Look, Lord, I'm keeping the Sabbath now. Look at what I'm doing, Lord. I don't eat pork or shrimp anymore. I don't even eat meat anymore, Lord. I'm a vegan now. Look at the wonderful things that I'm doing. Lord, look at all the community service that I'm doing. Look at all the ministries I'm a part of. Lord, look at how I'm dressed now. Look at all the things that I'm doing lord be impressed by me and we do this because we think that if we don't impress christ that he will leave us we think that he'll reject us and we're so busy living our lives trying to impress him that we miss him we should be living in the freedom of christ's mercy and christ's grace but instead we find ourselves living in fear of him rejecting us we should be resting in the assurance of christ's salvation but instead we find ourselves tirelessly working to improve ourselves because we're worried that we'll be lost. But Jesus never asked you to impress him. Jesus doesn't care about how much you fixed your life because you can't fix your life anyway. The reason that Christ wanted to get to know you in the first place is so that he could come into your heart and clean up the mess. You see, the problem is our focus is totally off. We get so focused on the home that is our hearts and we look in the corners and we see the dust and the dirt and we look at the different rooms of our heart and we see the mess that's there and we look in the closets of our heart and we see the skeletons that are hanging and we're afraid that Jesus is going to run away. But Jesus doesn't care about any of that. And in order for us to see that, we've got to shift our focus. We've got to shift how we're looking at ourselves and change our perspective from how we see things to how God sees things. Now, 
Let's look back at this story because if we look back at this story through the eyes of Christ, I guarantee we'll see a very different situation. The text says in verse 38 that Jesus was on their way and while they were on their way, they entered into a village. And when they entered into that village, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, it's important to understand that Jesus does not do anything by accident. You see, in the text, it might say that it was Martha that welcomed Jesus into her home. But I guarantee that Jesus got up that morning and when he spoke to God about his plans, he planned to go by Martha's house that day. So when Jesus went to Bethany, he went with the knowledge that he was going to be entering into Martha's home. Now, if Jesus knew this, then I guarantee that Jesus must have known that Martha did not have things ready to receive him. But he went anyway. Martha's home was not prepared and Jesus knew it and went into that situation knowing that there was no food, knowing that their house might be a mess and did it anyway. When Jesus found you, because let's be honest, you didn't find him. You didn't search him out. He was searching you out. When he got to you and found you, he knew exactly what he was getting into when he decided to get into your heart. Jesus knew what he was getting into when he saw you. He's the one that created you. He knows every hair that's on your head. He knows your comings and your goings. Do you think that Jesus doesn't know the mistakes that you've made? You think Jesus doesn't know the current state of your heart? No. Jesus knows exactly who you are. As a matter of fact, he knows you better than you know you. And he still decided, in spite of you, that he wanted to be with you. So Jesus enters into Martha's house, knowing the situation, and as soon as he gets into Martha's house, he goes to work. Because you see, when Jesus enters into your life, when Jesus enters into your heart, it's not just about you, but it's about the family and the friends and the people that surround you. Look what Jesus does. As soon as he gets into the house, he starts speaking to Mary. Now, Remember what we talked about. Mary is a woman. She has no business sitting and talking to Jesus. And the scriptures say that Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, this is something that should be taken literally. Yes, Jesus was talking and Mary was more than likely sitting at his feet. But it's also important to understand that this term should also be understood as a phrase. This term, sitting at someone's feet, that meant that that person was being discipled by the person that was teaching. People would say, I sat at the feet of Plato. I sat at the feet of Socrates. Well, in this text, Mary, a woman, is sitting at the place of a disciple, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus is actively discipling a woman. I could take a second really quick because there are a lot of people in this world especially as of late that would like to use scripture to tell you especially women that you have no place but look no further in this text to see how Jesus feels about you and how Jesus will treat you as a woman Jesus respects you as equally as every man that walks on this earth and not only that but he's willing to take the time to pour into you don't think that because you're a woman, you can't serve God. Don't think that because you're a woman, you're, you're less than a man. No, you are equal to, and God will give you equal power of a man. Amen. Now, getting back to my main point. Remember, Martha is upset because Mary is sitting and being discipled by Christ. The reason that Martha is so upset is because, again, she's a woman. 
Martha did not take the time to sit and learn from Christ because she knew as a woman she had no place. She believed that she was not worthy enough to sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him. You see, sometimes the problem that we have with fully coming to Christ and the reason that we try to impress him so much is that we don't think that we're worthy enough to truly be God's friend. You see, we think that we have to impress him so that he'll look on us favorably because we're not worthy. We're too sinful. We're too messed up. Maybe there's something that's social that makes us think that we're not good enough to come to God and to learn from God. But that was Martha's mistake. And that is what, is, that is what distracted her in the first place. Now, I'll say this. None of us in this room are worthy of the love and grace and teachings of Jesus Christ. And that is a fact. But that's also the point. You see, Jesus wants to teach you, wants to love you, wants to get into a relationship with you because you are not worthy. If you were, you wouldn't need him. But Jesus recognizes that we're the ones that need help. We're not perfect. And because of that imperfection, Jesus wants to take the time with us. Now, Martha is upset with Mary and says, Lord, she should be out here working with me. Why don't you tell her to do what I'm doing? You see, if Martha had done the right thing and sat with Mary and learned from Jesus and was allowed to be discipled and poured in to by Jesus, then she would not have the time to judge what it was that her sister Mary was doing. You see, when we're so busy trying to impress Jesus, we get so distracted and we start looking at other people and seeing what other people are doing and we start judging them because they're not doing what we think they should be doing. You see, we start talking about sister so-and-so because sister so-and-so was out here wearing jewelry and doing a bunch of foolishness that she shouldn't be doing when she should be in here working with me. I get upset with brother so-and-so because he's eating this and eating that and he should be a vegetarian like me. I start getting mad at this brother over here because he's not involved in enough ministries. I get involved. I get upset with that sister over there because she doesn't come out to Wednesday night prayer meetings like I do. But if you were more focused on your relationship with Christ, you would just be happy that someone was sitting next to you being filled by Christ just like you. You shouldn't have time to be worried about what brother so-and-so and and sister so-and-so are doing. You should be spending your time in the Word of God. You should be spending your time on your knees talking with God every morning, learning from Him each day so that you can be filled with the same Spirit that your brothers and sisters next to you are being filled with. You shouldn't have time for judgment because you should be filling your time with learning and understanding and being poured into by Christ. As we continue on, we see the concern that Jesus has when he begins to speak to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha, you are so anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. You see, what Jesus is trying to get at is, Martha, you're concerned about something that you have no control over. Martha, you're concerned with cleaning up something that I didn't care if you cleaned up or not. You see, here's the problem, and this is something that we do. Because we're so busy trying to impress Jesus, and we get into ourselves, and we think that we're going to clean up ourselves and clean up our act, and we're going to get rid of all of our sins. But what we don't realize is that we are trying to do Jesus' job for him. And instead of allowing Jesus to be the Savior that we need to come into my heart and sit on the throne of my heart, I have replaced Jesus with myself, and without realizing it, I have now denied the power of salvation in my life. Because I'm telling Jesus that I don't trust you enough to come in here and clean this stuff up because it's something that I need to do for myself. 
That's why Jesus is so concerned. Because when you take it upon yourself to clean up your life, you are still in danger of meeting the lake of fire in the end. Because you can't clean up you. The Bible says that all of your righteousness is like filthy rags. Have you ever tried to clean up something with a nasty rag? You know, you ever try to wipe, wipe down a table after you've eaten, but the rag that you got is like oily and it's got pieces of corn and peas in it, and you start wiping down the table, and all the food that you had on the cloth just gets everywhere? That's what you look like trying to fix your life. It doesn't make any sense. You don't have the power to fix you. The only one who does, his name is Jesus, and he came here willingly to fix your life. But Jesus says when he tells Martha, listen, Mary has chosen the good portion. That's a play on words. What Jesus is telling Martha is, look, see your sister over there? She chose the good part of the meal. Your food might be okay, Martha, but my food is something else. And Mary decided to have my food. You see, again, that's the problem with trying to fix stuff ourselves is you're trying to do something that you have no idea to do. You see, when you try to cook things up to eat so that you can fill your life, you ain't cooking the right stuff. Have you ever tried to cook in a dirty pot? Even worse, have you ever tried to cook something old in a dirty pot? Never comes out right. Because you see, there's something that Jesus can do that you can't. Jesus can clean out that pot. And there are things that Jesus is going to put in that pot that you have no idea about. There are certain ingredients that you just can't use. You don't know how to use the sweetness of love. You don't know how to use the saltiness and the savoriness of peace. You don't know how to use the spice of grace. You have no idea how these things are supposed to go into one thing and mix up and eat it and taste good. You have no power over that. That is only something that Jesus can do. Your cooking does not compare to the cooking of Christ. He is a master chef. You're not even a beginner. So don't don't try. Get out of the kitchen and let Jesus do the cooking in your life so that you can be filled with what he needs you to be filled with so that you can be saved. Get out of the way. Get out of the kitchen and take in the good portion, which is the relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to tell you a story. This story is of a small little bear, little teddy bear. This little teddy bear's name is Corduroy. Now, Corduroy is sitting on the shelf of a wonderfully huge department store, and every day Corduroy is waiting for someone to come and buy him. Well, one day Corduroy is sitting on the shelf, and as he's sitting there, a little girl comes up with her mom. The little girl sees Corduroy, she gets excited, and she says, Mom, Mommy, Mommy, that's the bear. That's the bear that I've always wanted. So the mom looks at the bear and says, Honey, we don't have time to buy this bear. You don't want this little strange fuzzy looking thing with these green overalls. And besides, it's missing a button. Come on, come on. I've, I've bought you all this stuff today. Let's go home. Lisa looks back at Corduroy. And in sadness, she goes home with her mom. Now, Corduroy hears this entire conversation, and he thinks to himself, oh, my goodness, I didn't realize that I was missing a button. So he says to himself, you know what? Later on tonight when the store is closed, I want to find a button. So the store closes. Corduroy gets down from his shelf, goes upstairs to the top floor of the department store, and he sees all of these mattresses. Now, on top of the mattresses, are buttons. So Corduroy, being so excited, hops on one of the mattresses and tries to pull off one of the buttons. But you see, the button is sewn into the mattress. So Corduroy pulls with all his might, trying to pull up the button, and he pulls and he pulls and pop! The button pops off. The button flies in the air. And Corduroy goes flying with the button. And he flies into a lamp, and the lamp crashes and makes a loud noise. And the security guard that's working that night hears the crash. So he goes upstairs, looks around to see what's going on, and there's this little bear sitting on a mattress. 
So a little confused, he picks up the bear, takes the bear downstairs, and puts it back on the shelf. And Corduroy is distraught. Now the next day, Corduroy wakes up. And when he opens his eyes, standing in front of him is that same little girl that he saw the day before. And she's smiling. She says, hi, my name's Lisa. I went home last night and I opened my piggy bank and I counted up all my money and I asked my mom and she said that I could come here today and take you home. So she goes, grabs corduroy off the shelf, doesn't ask for a wrapping, doesn't ask for a box. She just gives the clerk her money and she runs home, excited to take her teddy bear home. When she gets home and runs up to her room, she gives corduroy a big hug and says, corduroy, I love you just the way you are. But I want you to be more comfortable. So I'm going to give you a button. So she opens her little bag and pulls out a button. And she sews the button on corduroy. Now, what in the world does that story have to do with everything that I just talked about? You see, in the story, you're corduroy. You recognize that there's something wrong with you, that there's something wrong in your life. And you feel like in order to make it, in order to impress someone like God to be interested in you, you've got to fix things up yourself. So like Corduroy, you go on a journey trying to figure out how in the world you're going to make yourself presentable to God. But what you're going to find like Corduroy is that it's impossible. Because even if you do all the work to try to figure out how to make yourself whole, when you get to the point where you might have found the answer, it's going to be impossible for you to get it done for yourself. I mean, think about it. Corduroy is a teddy bear. If he got the button off the mattress, how is he going to sew it on himself? That's you trying to do works, thinking that you're going to impress God. But you see, Jesus is like that little girl, Lisa. You see, at the very beginning of the story, when Lisa first saw Corduroy, she said, that is the bear that I've always wanted. You see, in your state now, you are irresistible to Christ he loves you just the way you are. And when he sees you, he wants to take you just the way you are. And the beautiful thing about Christ is like that little girl who counted her pennies, counted the cost of how much it was going to take to bring Corduroy home. Christ counted the cost of what it would take to bring you home. And he saw that that price, that cost, was his life. And he paid it gladly, knowing that because of it, he'd take you home. It was when Corduroy was with Lisa that the button was finally placed on his overalls. You see, the fixing of your life doesn't happen before you meet Christ. It comes after Christ has saved you. Maybe this morning you've been so caught up in trying to impress Jesus. You've been so caught up in trying to clean up your life, hoping that Jesus would accept you, that you've forgotten that Jesus loves you Anyhow, maybe you didn't understand the depths of Christ's love for you, but the Bible tells us in Romans that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, I'd ask that you stand and come forward. You see, we go through this life and we go through the struggles of trying to make sure that we're perfect, but that's not your job. 
that's the job of Jesus Christ. All you have to do is be who you are. Be who you've always been. And let Jesus fill in the holes of your life. If there's not anyone that's willing to come forward this morning, then do a favor for me. If this spoke to you, just say the words in your heart. You don't have to come up here for Jesus to confirm you, for Jesus to save you. That's just making your stand publicly. But I would ask that in the closet of your home, in the quietness of your space, that you accept Jesus as your loving, personal Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we know that we're not perfect. We see the mistakes that we've made in our lives. We see the state of our hearts. And Lord, we're tired. We're tired of trying to put on a face, tired of trying to put on a facade. We're tired of trying to look like everything is okay when our life is in shambles. Lord, we're coming to you because we know that you have the power to fix us. But we're having a problem with coming to you, Lord, because we don't feel like we're worthy. Remind us, oh God, that your love extends past the exterior that your love extends past the sinful, dirty, messed up place that is our hearts. Help us to understand that your love reaches far deeper than anything that we understand. And that you, Lord, find us to be irresistible. And that you'll love us so much, you'll do whatever it takes to bring us close to you. Lord, if we've been struggling, help us to take that good portion. Help us to enter into a full relationship with you. Lord, we pray this prayer, we ask this thing knowing that it will be done because we've asked it in your character. We've asked it in your name. We thank you, O oh God, in Jesus' name.